Hi, I'm Dennis Weiss. Welcome to Why Like Ike. I have Troy Elkins, Pam Sanfilippo here at the Eisenhower Presidential Museum. We're in the education room. And we have a bunch of stuff that will look a lot of fun to the people watching TV and they know it will be a lot of fun to me. But we're still talking about Eisenhower as a young man. That's mm -hmm. the reason these things are here. So Pam, you're the resident expert because <laughs> you have the book I right here it. and the knowledge. So. Get us kicked off on the young Eisenhower and why guns are on the table today. Okay. Well, uh, from an early age, there were lots of people in, in Abilene who were getting their daily food from uh, the hunting that they did themselves. Um, and Eisenhower talks about uh, living close to a man, uh, Mr. Dudley, and then some of the other men in town who would go out to Mud Creek and they would have shooting contests and he would go out there and watch them and he said none of them were necessarily um, exceptional in their shooting abilities compared to an actual shooting exhibition that he might have seen but they were definitely above average in marksmanship and then his hero he said was a man named Bob Davis okay. who uh, was as Ike described him a bachelor, a philosopher, and to me a great teacher. And Bob would take him out on the Smoky Hill River and uh, teach him things about uh, trapping uh, and hunting. And he says, Bob had an old double-barreled shotgun. At the time it seemed perfectly natural for him to bring down two ducks from high overhead with two shots. Years later, when I began to try the same sport myself, I realized what a remarkable shot Bob Davis mm -hmm. was. Many of the programs that we've done in the last couple of months, I guess, uh, we've talked about younger Eisenhower. We've mm -hmm. talked about education. Uh, we've talked about a focus of his education and tracked his life as he grew up here. This is kind of the first time for us, Troy, mm -hmm. that we get to play with the stuff. <laughs> Maybe not so yeah. much you get to play with it, but I right. get to carefully yeah. touch it once in a while, although I'd love to play with it. So, the reality of it is it's still about a lesson of why like Ike as a young man to give people who grew up who are growing up here today the chance to understand that young Dwight David Eisenhower was no different than anybody else in this town or is no different than any other young boy in town today. Same hopes and dreams most likely. Mm -hmm. And spending time hunting, fishing, playing baseball, the same thing that well nowadays throwing some video games but uh, the same things I grew up doing. That, sure. That, as you're right, it is the same, it is the childhood that most of us enjoyed having. So. I appreciate the story you read, Pam. That's not much different than my childhood. Uh, the people who, um, our family were hunters and shooters, but you know, our associations with other people in the community were based around common interests, just like mm -hmm. they are today. And our common interests, lots were hunting, uh, shooting and associated things. Uh, it's just a great story for mm -hmm. small town America. Mm -hmm. And there's also a rather humorous story about Ike. Uh, he and his friends like to go camping for up to a week at a time and money would start running scarce and they'd have to do some uh, uh, creative thinking as to how they were going to make their money and their supplies last. So he talks about one summer, he, he, had, he had learned how to cook from his mother, and so he and another boy uh, were usually put in charge of doing the, the cooking for the, the group. And so they were running low, and he, he said he took an old shotgun and went out to see if he could find some rabbits and squirrels. He only got two or three squirrels, so when they came back, um, they knew for the number of boys it wasn't going to be enough food. <laughs> they added some potatoes and beans. But they started talking loudly, he and Ames, his uh, uh, co-cook, and he said, among other things, we said that we hoped that the crow we had just shot would make an edible <laughs> stew. <laughs> uh, they well, hoped wrongly. They well, hoped wrongly. So it was to fool the other boys so that they would not be as hungry and leave more for oh, Dwight and, wow. <laughs> and Ames, and it ended up working out that way. That's so. good. That's good. Okay. So... Um, I will make a comment, Troy, and then we can divert. Mm -hmm. So the guns you brought today, 
two shotguns, there are three pistols. None of them were available to a young boy of very modest means in Abilene, Kansas. These were these came to Ike the President or Ike the General, you can simply tell by looking, right? These are two very exclusive shotguns and, and decorative pistols. So tell us the history of the shotguns because I think that's pretty cool. Okay. Well it, it's Eisenhower's reputation kind of grew with him as he was coming up through the Army. And by the time he's a five-star general, everybody knows, okay, he's an outdoorsman, he mm -hmm. likes to hunt, he's got a thing for Western novels. So that kind of plays into these gifts that he starts getting. Uh, the first shotgun, this is a 16-gauge hammerless, and I cannot remember the name of the German company, but it was a, a wartime capture in World War II by the uh, Third Army Division, or Third Army Corps which this is the Army Corps that went and uh, relieved the siege on Bastogne during the Battle of the Bulge and also uh, crossed the bridge at Remagen and uh, actually was one of the first units across the Rhine. This was given to Ike in May of 1945 and it shows some signs of use. It was probably used before he got it because the stock is really well, well worn. Uh, the interesting thing about that is the museum actually opened in 1947 in the boyhood home and this is number 47-02. This is our second artifact we've ever logged in to the museum. That's so incredible. That was important enough to Ike that when he returned home and started setting up the museum that that was one of the first things he sent to us. When I walked in today and these were laying on your cart getting ready to be prepared for display, I looked and I saw that obviously that's a Purdy shotgun, P-U-R-D-Y, not Purdy as in from the country. Um, but this one, uh, my first thought was that's a capture. That is, that's a recently, in 1945, liberated shotgun right. from uh, uh, Third Corps as they went through the area because it's... Yeah. It's got the classic sling attachments on front and rear, which means as beautiful a gun as it is, it was still meant to be a hunting carried shotgun. Europeans carried slings on their shotguns with slings right. frequently. And then you can actually, if you'll notice on the, on the buttstock of it, the, the sling swivel has been broke off of it, so right. it was definitely used. And yeah. uh, you, you mentioned the functionality. The, the shotguns are considered a functional art. It's like a fine watch. Well, mm -hmm. Someone's told me that before and actually there's even an ad for Purdy Shotguns and Rolex saying that the owners, of the directors right. of Purdy Shotguns wear Rolex because it is fine craftsmanship. Mm -hmm. They're meant to be used, They're meant, their art is in how they work. Um, now the Purdy Shotgun was actually correspondence started between Tom Purdy who was one of the sons of Purdy and Sons he was running the company at the time, started writing Eisenhower in, in the fall of 1946 saying, hey, we want to give you a 12-gauge duck gun and we need to get you measured so that we get it crafted the proper fit for you. So uh, when Eisenhower uh, received it, he was really excited except he had mentioned that he had shoulder, his shoulder was bothering so it would be a while before he could shoot it. He received it on December 7th of 1946. Mm. So five years after the start of World War I, uh, start of World War II, he is being given a very expensive shotgun. Uh, now fast forward to 1955, he has a golf buddy that's also a oil man in California by the name of Charles Jones. Uh, he was very active in Republican politics in California, especially during uh, the, the 1958 uh, California gover governor's election. Uh, so they start riding back and forth. They start golfing together, planning trips together. And in 1960, Eisenhower decides to send the Purdy shotgun to him. Hmm. So there's a nice letter from 1960 from uh, Mr. Jones stating, this gun really I, really, I love it so much, it's difficult to even put down, it's so beautiful, so I can write this letter. By the way, it represented itself quite well in Mexico. So mm -hmm. he took it hunting down in Mexico and was quite successful with it. Everything that you bring us uh, as an artifact, that's the reason we make this program is because there is a story behind it. 
if we're just showing artifacts, we'd take the camera around and just take pictures, right? It's mm -hmm. the story that intrigues the human interest portion of it, that people can look at this shotgun and follow that trail of imagination through those years. And it's an important part of history. It's a great, great story. So how did we get it back? <laughs> uh, well, when Mr. Jones died, it was in his will that it was going to come here and be part of the collection. Wow. So uh, we actually have the letters from his attorney saying, hey, this is coming to you by such and such post and be looking for it. And once you receive it, and of course, return the documents to us and you have it. And, uh, and that happens all the time today. You're still receiving artifacts from people who clear out the attic or find mother's had it Had box. a gentleman walk in today and he's going to be delivering it later this week, offering uh, World War, his father's World War I uniform and a uh, mess kit that had a list of all the towns that he went to when he was in, in World War I. So we're, that, that happens, like you said, when people mm -hmm. clean out their attics or start mm -hmm. with mom and dad and grandma and grandpa stuff, and we love it every single time we get it. The um, previous month program that we filmed talked about education, and, and Eisenhower Pam had made the point about uh, the expectation that, that people would inform themselves so that they, of, about the in, items of civic interest so they could be good citizens. The same information is required today to be a good citizen, the, the desire to inform oneself. I guess we're saying come by coming here and even participating in this program today by watching it, you're investing in yourself to learn about one of the most important citizens of the world that just happened to grow up in Abilene, Kansas. Dwight David Eisenhower. Exactly. Okay. Okay, Pam, because you're not normally in the gun shows we do here. <laughs> right. This I've is learned new all kinds for you. Already. Yeah, <laughs> things already. Exactly. So I've it's enjoyed wonderful. having you on camera many times because your your job here is education today. Mm -hmm. You work to educate young people. You help them in the research project, and you do lots of things in education. So put a spin on it today. You're the one who sees the faces who come in here mm -hmm. at 14, 15 years old. How important is this institution to still informing people of their civic responsibilities as young people today? I think it's, it's crucial and one of the things that uh, occurred to me is, as Troy was talking about how we are still getting donations, it's also evidence of the trust people place in this institution to care for and preserve those items and then carry on that legacy of, of Eisenhower. So uh, it's, it's this great um, relationship between the community, citizens, and, and this library and, and museum. You know, I think we get kind of used to how the greatness you know, when you live in the middle of it, you, you see this transaction of the culture, you see the transaction of knowledge, you see 800 researchers come and go a year, you see this thing and so you kind of get that's your new normal. It's not normal. It <laughs> doesn't happen everywhere. People in, in the rest of the world don't have this unparalleled access to the generation of information that created so much value in the world that all of us enjoy today. It's really unique from the Eisenhower Presidential Library. It really is. And I couldn't even touch a historic Walter like that without <laughs> getting slapped. Anywhere else in the world, most likely. They may slap yeah. me after it goes off, but not oh. while the camera's on. Not with the gloves on, you're fine. <laughs> <laughs> She's got eyes on me back there. So tell us, is there a story on the Walter? Okay, well the Walther was given to Ike in, by the 90th Infantry Division. It, okay. it is a German capture as well, but this one's been embellished just a little bit. Just some, a little bit. Someone liked to do some scroll work. They did, and, nice uh, job too. If, and I know that you've already got some close-ups of it, but if you look on the slide, it says to Dwight D. Eisenhower. Mm -hmm. But also, if you look on the top, on the top. it says to John Money. In 1955. May of 55. May of 55. Now, Master Sergeant Money was uh, Eisenhower's personal aide. He, oh. through his army days as five star general, and was placed on loan to the White House as uh, by the army for Eisenhower. And he, okay. he stayed with Eisenhower through his eight years in the White House. Uh, again, this was another example that 
Ike, with these guns, he wanted them to be used, and, and he, of course, himself as president, normally didn't have time to do it. So he would pass these on. And uh, when uh, Master Sergeant Money died, he actually sent it back, to, his wife sent it back to us to have it as an artifact for here. What, an, uh, what a great story again. I wish next time we come here, for whatever reason, somebody takes responsibility of learning more about Master Sergeant Money. We should know that. That's got to be a good story. Mm -hmm. Pam's yeah. nodding. Yeah. That yes. means she's oh, yeah. going to yes. do it. <laughs> this gun is the only gun out here that hasn't been shot a lot. This gun has been yeah. fired, but hardly any, right? Less than 50 rounds were, were put through that. This is a great, great Western Arms uh, replica of a Colt single action army, or the Frontier model. Mm -hmm. the, the gun that was very popular in Westerns. At the end of uh, of uh, World War II, Colt had quit making single action armies right. because they were too busy cranking out wartime supplies. And uh, so Great Western Arms stepped in and started making these for replicas and for, you know, Westerns were very popular at the time, so everybody wanted one. Unfortunately, they, uh, the early years for Great Western was a little bit difficult. They were rocky. They had the technical, the, the plans and everything for it, but they didn't have the knowledge that Colt did. And so they, their product was not great. And we actually have a letter from the, spe the Secret Service Special Agent in charge who had sent this to a gun range that was being ran by the Coast Guard, who at the time was part Department of the Treasury. And the uh, chief in charge of the gun range went out and put 50 rounds through it and wrote back to the special agent who wrote to the president and said, under no circumstances fire this <laughs> weapon because it's probably going to blow up. And, and gave a long list of problems with it. They look very good from the outside. On the inside, uh, there's a few issues. few issues. Yeah. Uh, fortunately, at Great Western, a few years later, they hired a Colt guy to come in and help them, and their, their quality of weapons improved. But they went out of business in the late 60s. So, and that's, the, that's one of the, the only guns that was not given to anyone as a gift. It was actually sent directly here on, on the letter to him. Oh, really? That says, send to Abilene. Well, he takes good advice. Yes. In other words, he, he didn't want it in rotation. He wanted it put he away. He wanted it hidden. <laughs> safe, or, not hidden, at least somewhere safe where it's not going to be fired. And what's the story on the Smith & Wesson revolver we have here? The Smith & Wesson revolver is a gift of the uh, National Association, or National Chiefs, sorry, National Sheriff's Association. Okay. Uh, it was given to him in 1954 or 55, I believe. And it's 38 special. And they, it came with a badge and a lifetime membership, gold-plated lifetime membership card. And he gave that to his son John. And John took it out and shot John it. John shot it quite a bit, actually. <laughs> there's, there's, yes. uh, it, it's been used. Yes. And then he uh, turned it back over to us in 1960. So right. he went Very and had cool. a few years of fun with it, and Very then, cool. and then let us have it back. So you know. Dwight David Eisner uh, sat in the White House through eight years of peace and prosperity, and uh, when he got done with that, he gave it back to us too. Yes. Right? And here we are. Um, Dave gave me the two minutes a little bit yeah. ago, so we're about to finish up here. Want to thank you for bringing me some things I love to look at, Troy. I appreciate yeah. that. Pam, thank you for bringing some context. For the rest of the people at home, they go, oh, no, Dennis has got guns again. So, <laughs> you know, thank you for the context of young Dwight David Eisenhower and, frankly, why things like this were important to him as a person. So, therefore, people all across the world gave him things as a measure of their appreciation. Mm -hmm. Most of all, why like I? Gosh, because you have people like this who come work here every day, make these artifacts preserved able for you to see them, and probably most importantly, able you, for you to understand why it's important. Had fun, you? Yeah, great time. Okay, all right, until next time, for Why Like Ike, I'm Dennis Weiss, I work for Eagle Communications, Pam Sanfilippo, and over there, Troy Elkins, and they work for all of us right here at the Eisenhower Presidential Library Museum and Boyhood Home. We're wishing you a great day.